Okay, welcome to the rest of our Religion 250 class for the rest of the semester. I have to say I'm very sad that, uh, that I won't be able to meet with you face to face anymore, but that's okay. We'll make it, we'll make do and move forward. What we're going to be doing is we're going to have to compress some of the final lessons in the syllabus. So if you go to page two, um, I will just keep working through until we finish up the week of the atoning sacrifice lessons, and then we'll just go really fast on the remaining ones leading into the final exam. Uh, so today's lesson, you'll remember um, in the last little while we've been talking about the parables. So we had three lessons on the parables of Christ. Before that we had the miracles of Christ, and before that we had his sermon. So we've had a couple of, or three different types of his teaching. Now we're going to go into more of the personal nature of Christ, his his one-on-one uh, -on -one experiences with Mary and Martha, with Bartimaeus, and with the woman taken in adultery for today. So let's begin. Uh, go ahead and turn in your scriptures. The final exam is going to still be open scripture with notes written in your scripture, so please don't, don't overlook that fact. Uh, go ahead and open them up and be taking notes. I'll meet you in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. So it's the very last few verses of Luke chapter 10. I'll write that up here. Now, as you're turning there, I want you to, to quietly consider the story, what you know, what you understand about Mary and Martha. When you hear the names Mary and Martha, what do you instinctively think? Is it uh, Mary good, Martha bad, or Mary better, Martha good, but not quite as good as, as Mary? Through the years, people have interpreted this particular scripture and have really beat up Martha to a large degree, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So let's pick it up. Verse 38. It came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Mark it. It's her house. It's not Mary's house. It's Martha's house. She seems to be the, the, the one in charge here. Um, notice in verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. So here's the scenario. You can picture this. Jesus sitting there with Mary sitting at his feet and you have Martha over here in the kitchen cumbered about much serving. Can you, can you picture this scenario? Jesus has come from a long journey because they live, Mary and Martha live down in Bethany. Jesus has come from clear up in the Galilee. So this has been a long journey. Here's Jerusalem. Bethany is just on the, the other side of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. So he's probably come either this way or down through Samaria, either way. It's been a long journey. He's come into Martha's house. He's probably exhausted, he's tired, so he's sitting down. And can you picture the different sisters' responses? Martha saying, oh, Jesus is here. Can you picture going around cleaning up the room really quickly, making it all ready? Okay, you sit right here. I'll go and get you something. And she goes into the kitchen, whereas Mary is much more of a quiet person from what we can see in multiple stories involving the two sisters. And she's just so excited to see Jesus. She sits at his feet and uh, is just absorbing this moment with him when Martha gets pretty discouraged, pretty frustrated. Look what she says. She came to the Lord in verse 40 and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Now, 
I want you to picture this for a minute. What, what would the look on Mary's face be at that moment? As she's sitting there at the feet of Jesus and, and Martha comes up and says, Lord, my sister basically is being lazy. Can you, can you make her come in and, and help me? You'd probably feel pretty badly if you're Mary at this point. Have you noticed something? Every time in the scriptures when somebody comes up to Jesus and tells, them, tells him something about somebody else in an accusatory way, he never, ever, ever acknowledges what they've said and pats them on the back and says something like, Oh, thank you. I, I was not aware of that. He, he doesn't do that. What he always does is he points the person back to themselves and back to the Old Testament on, on other occasions. And in this case, Martha has been trying to correct Mary in front of Jesus. So notice his response. Verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, I want you to pause the video for just a second and ponder the different options as to why Jesus would say, Mary hath chosen the good part, and it shall not be taken away from her. Martha, you've been encumbered about much serving, but Mary hath chosen the good part. What is the good part? Just, I want you to spend just a few moments thinking about that before I, I dump some things on the, uh, on the table for you to consider. Okay. Now, here's how this story has been interpreted for many, many years, centuries. And here's the cool thing. There's no one right way or layer at which to interpret this story. We can, we can look at various levels of, of potential meaning, and that's where scripture study becomes helpful. So don't feel like I'm trying to force you into one or two or three options. There are a million options as to why Jesus said this. All I'm going to start with here is to say that for centuries, Martha has been denigrated as less than or not as good as Mary, because Mary chose the good part. And so people have said, you shouldn't be off trying to serve and work in the kitchen, um, meeting people's physical needs but rather sitting at the feet of Jesus, allowing him to meet your spiritual needs. And that is a really valid layer of interpretation for this particular story. Is it possible that there are other possible uh, applications here as well? What if you consider the fact that Mary, but let's just play, let's pretend for a moment. Let's pretend that Mary had been sitting there at the feet of Jesus, and you can picture Martha in the kitchen clamoring around with pots and pans and, and dishes. What if Mary had said to Jesus, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister is making this loud noise in the kitchen? What? Bid her come and sit down next to me so that we can welcome you properly and, and be polite, and then afterwards we'll both go into the kitchen together and get something to eat. Do you think for a minute that Jesus would have said in the next sentence, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but Mary hath chosen the better part out here. Come sit down by her. I guess that's possible, but I don't think that's probable. I think Jesus would have said to Mary that maybe in, in that particular instance that Martha had chosen a better part, which is simply this on a different level of, of application, it is this. We are all created differently. There's, there's none of us, there are none of us, that, that in this collective group of humanity that was created identical to somebody else. We are, we are very unique, all of us. Problems arise when we look around and we try to get other people to become more like us. And when we get annoyed or frustrated, when they don't see things the way we see them, we, they don't approach problem solving the way we do. They don't approach relationships the way we do. Can you, can you imagine for a minute what would happen if you went to a, 
a sporting event and everybody on the team all of a sudden played the exact same position, it, that team would never win. Or you go to a, a concert and we don't have an orchestra with different instruments, we only have one type of instrument, it, it would get pretty dull. The fact that God made us all different means we can combine our resources and our approaches to life into this beautiful, harmonious web of humanity doing God's work. Picture for a minute what your Relief Society back home would look like if every one of the sisters in your ward was like Martha. They're just constantly going around serving, looking, seeing a need, a physical need, and meeting it, and taking care of, of the environment, and what can I get for you to, to make you comfortable, and to feed you, and to take care of your, your uh, a place to stay, and to sleep, and all of those things. If, if everybody in your whole ward was exactly like Martha, it might get a little overwhelming for all these people competing to try to help and serve. Well, what if everybody in your home were, were like Mary and we didn't have any Marthas? That could be a serious problem as well. The fact is, who does Jesus love more, Mary or Martha? And that's a stupid question, of course, because the obvious answer is God loves them equally. The problem in this story started when Martha came to Jesus to try to get Mary to become more like Martha. That's where she gets Jesus's interaction. You'll notice he didn't interrupt her while she was in the kitchen first. He only responded to her when she confronted Mary. So perhaps one of the, the potential applications for us to consider here today is in your own relationships. Instead of being annoyed because people are different from you, recognize those differences. Celebrate the fact that they're able to do some things that you, you don't instinctively do well. And be grateful that you've got some things that you're able to contribute really well in that setting and uh, it's gonna be a, a much better experience for us now let's take these two sisters and go one step further go over with me to John chapter 11 John chapter 11 in this story we get uh, Lazarus the brother of Mary and Martha and he passed away but before he died Mary and Martha sent word from Bethany up to the Galilee to Jesus to say, hey, Lazarus, your friend, he, he's not doing well. You've got to come home or you've got to come down here to, to help him. And Jesus delayed. He waited on purpose. And uh, then Jesus, after a time, said, okay, disciples, let's go. And they started walking. And Jesus said he was going to go down and wake up Lazarus, at which point in chapter 11 of John, his, his apostles are saying, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll do well. Just leave him alone. And Jesus then turns to them and spake very plainly and said, Lazarus is dead. Uh, in bottom of verse 14. So then they show up. Notice the contrast. Watch what happens. See if you can picture the relationship uh, difference that Martha has with Christ versus the relationship that Mary has with Christ. So here he comes, verse 20. When Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Hmm. The one who would most likely be up and around and be aware and maybe looking out the window or hearing people talking versus the one who might be sitting a little more quietly, a little more contemplatively. Martha, Mary. It, it kind of fits. So Martha goes out. Now look at verse 21 through 30. So I want you to pause the video. This is really important because I need you to work through these verses on your own. You're going to go John 11, 21 through 30. And you're going to mark how Jesus interacts one-on-one -on -one with Martha. How, what does she need from Jesus? And what does he give her? This is beautiful. So just 
just mark the, the interaction in verse 21 through 30. Okay, now, you probably noticed that in that interaction, Martha needed to talk. She said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Verse 21, they have that interaction where he, he makes some assurances. And then verse 25, you could mark verse 25. This is, in my opinion, the single most powerful witness of Jesus Christ, personal witness of Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ's divinity in the Gospels of anybody except for maybe it matches Peter's testimony back in, in the Gospel of Matthew when he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, here it is where, verse 25 through 27, so Jesus tells her he's the resurrection, and whosoever liveth, believeth in me shall never die. Verse 27, she said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, that should come into the world. It's a pretty profound testimony there especially in that moment when she lost her brother. He's laid in the grave now four days. Now let's contrast that for a minute with verse 32. Uh, then when Mary was come where Jesus was, because Martha sent word into her, and she came running out, she saw him. Notice some differences here. She fell down at his feet. There's no mention of the falling down with Martha. She, she's she's maybe a little more tuned in to let's let's have this conversation i want to understand this with my head mary seems to be a little more tender-hearted and neither one is right or wrong they're just different god created them differently and that's beautiful it's wonderful now watch what happens she says lord if thou hadst been here my brother had not died you can draw a little line between verse 32 and verse 21. Mary and Martha have the same faith in Christ. Two very different sisters with different approaches to how they live their life, but at the core, the thing that matters the most, their trust and faith in God, it's, it's pretty much the same, and it's beautiful. Now watch the difference. Verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. You'll notice that Jesus in that moment doesn't say to Mary, Mary, come on, where's your faith? You, you told me that if I had been here, your brother had not died. Don't you believe that I can do this? He doesn't chide her. He doesn't, he doesn't make fun of her. He doesn't belittle her. He she makes her statement, having fallen to the ground, pleading with him to understand with her heart, and then she starts weeping. There's no sign of Martha weeping. Martha just wanted to talk it through. She wanted to get to the bottom of this. Mary is now weeping. The Jews that are with her are weeping. Notice verse 35. It's the shortest verse in all of scripture in words. And it's quite frankly one of the longest verses in all of scripture in profound meaning because this shows us a glimpse into the heart into the character into the soul of jesus what kind of a person he is how he feels about people jesus wept you can look at those two words and say, hmm, maybe, maybe he's weeping because he's sad that Lazarus died. That's, that's possible, but not very probable. You could say he's weeping because he feels bad for all these people because he knows that in a very short period of time, he's going to die. And he knows that these same people are going to be weeping at his passing. And that would be very heartwarming. And that's potentially part of his tears. You could also say he's weeping because of the, the magnitude of what is about to come upon him and the, the reality hitting him. That could be a part of it. And there could be multiple layers of other things that are causing him to weep. But perhaps one of the biggest reasons for Jesus' tears on that day are simply because he has a person that he loves on the ground in front of him, Mary, and she's crying. 
And Jesus tells us in our baptismal covenant that we are to mourn with those that mourn and comfort those that stand in need of comfort. I love this little story because you see Jesus comforting Martha in a way that would speak and respond, that, that Martha would be able to respond to and connect with. And he's mourning with Mary in a way that Mary will feel connected to and, and she'll feel understood. Um, Jesus then asks them to take him to the tomb where he's going to have the, the stone rolled back and Lazarus to be brought out of the grave. What I want you to do is read the rest of this chapter on your own very quickly. And I want you to notice some things as you read this. I want you to try to put yourself there. And if you, if you relate to Martha's way of living, then try to put yourself in her position and watch what she says and does in the rest of the story. And if you relate more to Mary or to a random person, a, a bystander, just try to picture what it might have been, been like to be there as you read the rest of this chapter with this in mind. What is there in your own life that feels dead, that feels forever gone? Keep in mind, he's been in the grave four days. Jewish tradition is pretty strong that once a person's been three days dead, the spirit of that person is now gone. It, it might linger for a while, but now it's, it's fully gone. So for Lazarus to have been in the grave for four days, there's no chance. It's pretty, pretty obvious because after three days, a body that hasn't been prepared for burial with embalming or with preservation techniques will begin to decay. And so you can imagine the, the concern for, for somebody like Martha, especially when he tells them to roll back the stone. This isn't going to be pretty. And yet, if we give our life to Jesus and we trust him completely, he's able to call back from the dead things that uh, maybe the rest of the world would say that's impossible. It's a beautiful story. So read the rest of it on your own, looking through those perspectives. Okay, now let's grab two more quick stories and watch Jesus interacting with people, giving them exactly what they need. Okay, go with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. You're going to start in verse 46. So Mark 10, 46. Here we get the story of Bartimaeus. So Bartimaeus lives, if you look at the, uh, this map here, here's the Dead Sea down here on a bigger scale. So Jerusalem's up here, Jericho's here. Bartimaeus is in the outskirts of Jericho. Jesus is on his way up this huge climb from Jericho up the mountain, Mount of Olives, into Jerusalem. So this is not going to be an easy day for Jesus as he makes that final ascent to Jerusalem. Oh, and by the way, look at the chapter heading in chapter 11. What's the very next event in Mark's gospel? It's the triumphal entry. So this is probably the last time Jesus is going to be down here in Jericho, and he's making his final ascent to begin the week of the atoning sacrifice, which is what we're going to begin in our next lesson, is the triumphal entry. Uh, as he comes to the outskirts of Jericho in verse 46, it says, As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Remember, we don't know most people's names of, of who Jesus healed, people who received a miracle directly from him by name. This is one that we do. So the fact that Mark knew his name 20 years later, whenever it was that Mark wrote his gospel, that's significant uh, because it's not just a blind man, it's Bartimaeus. So I, I'm holding out hope, I don't know this for sure, but I'm holding out hope that this is uh, Brother Bartimaeus's story, that 20 years later he's still a, a faithful disciple of Christ in the community that would be known by the, the people of Mark. 
to whom Mark is writing his gospel. So here's blind Bartimaeus. He sat by the highway side begging, knowing the timeline. Do you think that Jesus has a few things on his plate that he needs to accomplish in the next few days? Do you think he could be distracted a little bit? Bartimaeus found out that it was Jesus of Nazareth. That name means something among the disabled community. And so he started shouting out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. People are trying to shut him up. And he's saying, no, 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 I, I need help. Jesus, have mercy. Would any of you be offended if Jesus, without without even breaking stride, just stretched out his hand and said, Bartimaeus, be healed, and then kept walking? I, I don't think anyone would be bothered by that. Or even if he just thought the words, Bartimaeus, be healed, and he wouldn't have to stop at all. I want you to take verse 49. Look at those first four words. You might consider marking them. And Jesus stood still. If Jesus can find a way to stand still on that moment for Bartimaeus, for one guy, then he'll find a way to stand still for you today is, uh, for me, the biggest lesson. So he commanded for Bartimaeus to be called. He comes in front of Jesus, and Jesus then asks him, what, what wilt thou that I shall do for thee or unto thee? And the blind man said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said in verse 52, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And we could end there, but the coolest part of this story is we've got a physical miracle that's now performed, but watch the spiritual miracle unfold. unfold. And immediately he received his sight, physical miracle, and followed Jesus in the way, spiritual miracle. Jesus told him to go his way, and he followed Jesus in the way, which was a really steep, hard, hot climb that day. It was not the path of least resistance. It wasn't the path, path of comfort or ease. So I love the fact that this blind man is now healed physically, but he's touched so profoundly that he follows Jesus where he's going, and we know Jesus is going up into Jerusalem. Okay, one more story. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. This story, you need, to, you need to somehow make a marking in your scriptures, in your, your uh, margin there. John chapter 8, verse 1 through... 11 does not appear in any, not any of our earliest dating manuscripts of the Gospel of John. It doesn't, doesn't exist in John's earliest uh, records that we have access to. It all of a sudden shows up out of the blue. Uh, later, a copyist puts it in sometime in the, in the 4th or 5th century. Um, but here's the cool thing about this. Instead of you crossing out verse 1 through 11 saying, okay, John didn't write this, be careful. Because this happens to be one of the most profound stories about how Jesus interacts with individuals. And even though we don't have the book where this story was contained, um, early Christian writers, we call them the patristic writers that uh, give commentary and write letters and books and things back and forth, about what's in the scriptures. This particular story is talked about quite a bit, and it comes from a book called the, the Gospel of the Hebrews. It's a lost book. We don't have access to it, but these early writers are talking about it where they say a sinful woman was, was caught and brought before Jesus here in this particular setting. And so some later copyist took something from the Gospel of the Hebrews and inserted it into its proper time frame in the Gospel of John. So it's preserved for us. It's a beautiful story. Here's the setup. You have Jesus who's teaching a group of people in the temple. Okay, 
So this is his, we'll call this classroom A. He's in the middle of teaching them when in comes a group of, of uh, priests, chief priests here, um, Pharisees, scribes, actually, in verse 3. They brought him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, so we have classroom B, which is a classroom of one, one woman, and we have classroom C, which are these Pharisees and scribes who have brought her in. Now notice this, they say, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Can you see the trap? Can you see if Jesus says, oh, don't stone her? Then they say, well, then you're refuting Moses. You're making yourself higher than Moses. And if he says, don't, or, or if he says, do stone her, they could make all kinds of claims against what he's been teaching about mercy and long suffering and forgiveness and kindness and gentleness. Um, just as a side note, it's been hundreds of years since the, the children of Israel, since these, these people have been actively stoning adulterers. Um, so, so these Pharisees are bringing up this law that used to be enforced back in the days of Moses and Joshua. It was being enforced, full-fledged, but it hasn't been probably since the time of David and Solomon uh, or even before with Saul. And now they're throwing this at him. By the way, can any of you see the major problem with this particular situation? This woman was caught in the very act of adultery, and all they brought was the woman. Uh, this smacks of a total setup, of a total framing to try to trap Jesus. Because the law of Moses that they're, they're referring to actually puts the emphasis on stoning the man. And then it says, and the woman with him. It's almost like, a, oh yeah, by the way, you need to stone the woman as well. But in this case, they've just brought the woman, which makes it feel very, very, um, very dubious how they've set this up. And Jesus, sitting there, says uh, nothing to them. Look at verse 6. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And then in italics, as though he heard them not. The implication is, is he's, he's just ignoring them, but he wrote on the ground. Mark it. That's the only time in the entire New Testament where we get any sign of Jesus writing. We have other places where he reads and where he'll quote scripture, but this is the one time where he writes. And he, it says he wrote with his finger on the ground in the temple complex. By the way, the temple is still under construction at this time, so there would be construction elements uh, there and and materials and he writes with his finger on the ground can anybody see any symbolism there that same finger wrote in stone tablets 1500 years ago the commands that they're now calling him into question on we don't know what he actually wrote on the ground the early patristic writers had a lot of theories about what was written and some of them are better than others some are quite funny and comical others are really probably more close to the to the truth of what actually happened but we're not going to speculate here as to what he actually wrote the point is this by him not responding he's now drawn the attention off of her the accused and put it down onto whatever he's doing on the ground he could have been just doodling even it doesn't matter as much what he wrote is the fact that it drew the attention to away from her and put it to him. So he stooped down writing. And then verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. That's more than just theoretical. There was somebody who was without sin among them. And he was the one talking to them. Let he who is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And you'll notice there were no stones cast that day. Not one. He was the only one who could have accused her 
and actually thrown the stone, but he didn't throw any stones. And again, verse 8, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. So whatever he wrote on the ground convinced classroom C to be pricked in their conscience and they left one by one beginning at the eldest down to the youngest they left they came in with with murderous disposition like let's kill her and and trap him in the process or look, they had horrible intentions and when they walked out they're pricked in their conscience so he's able to even find a way to make classroom C be edified now it says, when they left, the woman was standing alone in the midst. Classroom A hasn't dispersed. They're, they're watching what is going to happen here. But as far as Jesus is concerned, the woman is standing alone in the midst. Nobody's coming to rally around her. Nobody's putting an arm around her. Nobody's saying, wow, how can I help you? Um, or how can we help you improve and move forward? So Jesus, instead of throwing a stone at her, comes to her aid by saying, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus saith unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way, or go, and sin no more. And the Joseph Smith translation there is really, really important to mark. That uh, it says, And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. So she is going to go and leave a much better person than she was when she was brought in, in shock and in fear, in this unknown situation. Classroom A if they had eyes to see and ears to hear, they saw some things about how to treat people, even people who moments before were taken in the very act of adultery and instead of shaming them even further to help them grow and progress and move forward in whatever way possible on the covenant path as Jesus is showing her this, this pathway to, to move forward and progress rather than being held hostage in the past. Now, in conclusion, we've told the stories, a couple of stories from Mary and Martha, from Lazarus and how Jesus interacts with Mary and Martha, from blind Bartimaeus, and now from this woman caught in the very act of adultery. Today, there's been a fourth classroom that Jesus taught. It's the classroom that you and I are sitting in thanks to the fact that we have access to these scriptures that we got to be a witness of this experience vicariously 